Hello and welcome to the Chess on Toast game of the day. My name's Nick Murphy and with me, as always, International Master Lauren De Costa. Lauren, hello. Hi, you Nick. How are you? Hi, very well, thank you. Uh, before we get into the game that you brought for us today, I'd just like to mention our new DVDs are out now. We now have six Chess on Toast DVDs, don't we? Uh, we've got the Scotch Four Nights, uh, Scotch Gambit, uh, what else have we got? Joker Piano. Evans Gambit, Milner Barry Gambit, to name but a few. So, and uh, uh, Bishop B5 Sicilian. So check them out, chessontoast.com now. Okay, so let's get into the video. Lauren, what game are you going to show us in this video? Well, uh, this weekend just gone, which is the, uh, the first week of May in 2013, we had the culmination of the British League, what's called the 4NCL, the Four Nations Chess League. And uh, the last deciding match was between uh, two teams, two of the top teams, Wood Green, Hillsmark, and Guildford won. And they had a lot of big guns. So uh, you, see, you actually played in this tournament, didn't you? I actually did. Well, my team came third, oh, just behind nice. these two big guns. And okay. uh, we had the honour of playing Guildford uh, on the Saturday. But on the Monday, the key match was between those two. And uh, we had our well, one of our favourite players at Chess on Toast, Mickey Adams, the England number one. Absolutely. And here he plays against the French Grandmaster, Laurent Fressenet, who's also around the 2700 mark, so uh, a pretty decent rating by anyone's standard. Yeah, even very, if it, very good, strong Grandmaster player. Even if you had that rating on the Internet Chess Club, I still think that'd be quite <laughs> high. Um, but what's so surprising or most interesting for us here at Chess on Toast was the fact that Mickey, as White, used one of our favourite openings. Let's see if you, as the viewer, can recognise it. If you've either seen our DVDs or not, you might be able to recognise what happened. Yep. And uh, the game started with E4. This is Mickey's favourite move. And a lot, of our, a lot of our DVDs, in fact, I think all of them start with E4. That's right, yeah. and most of them start with E5 as well. Yeah. Like black counters. And um, all four knights came out like this. <gasps> That's that's the first clue, isn't that's it? That's the first clue, isn't it? Now, White now played D4, that important pawn thrust in the centre, D4. There's four knights. Right, where are you going with this, Nick? I think, is this the Evans Gambit? Uh, have I not taught you well at all? Right, oh. uh, I think there's a bit of sarcasm going on, it, hopefully. Uh, I might, might be just a little bit. <laughs> Nick's I not think... that bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Scotch Four Knights. This is the Scotch Four Knights, that's right. Our very and first Chess on Toast DVD. That's right, and uh, that's sort of the point of with this move pawn to d4 so of course white has lots of other developing moves here like bishop b5 which is the four knights lopez but here we're going to look at d4 and that was what mickey played and mickey doesn't normally play this but this has become well fairly when i say fashionable uh the ex-world champion last year vladimir kramnik played this against the Runian, the two of the top three players in the world and i think we feature that game in the dvd that's we? right and i'm not sure that kramnik actually bought our dvd but uh, I'm going to say that he did, and he got all those ideas off us. But anyway... <laughs> if we featured the game in the DVD, I don't think he would have got the idea. <laughs> well, there goes that idea. Right. Right, so D4, and uh, <laughs> Fresnay knows his basics, and he knows that if you should do a pawn exchange in the centre, then you should... Well, you generally should. Yeah. Because White has this pressure on E5 here, doesn't he? So I think Black needs now to do something about that. So he swapped, and here he played Bishop B4, setting up this pin onto the king on E1. All fairly standard stuff. Now, the game that we talked about there was Kramnik against Aronian in Zurich last year in their match. And uh, Aronian played bishop to c5. So after bishop e3, he did not fall for any tricks on here. No. He played bishop b6. And then the game continued from there. So it shows that, uh, that you can have more than one good move in certain positions. That's right. I mean, in any opening, you should remember the standard basic yep. ideas. Develop towards the centre, castle early, and here you see both sides doing that. So even the world's top players sticking to the basics. So, so in both of those times, the the black uh, the dark squared bishop was coming out to good squares. That's right. And here it's a sort of it's supposedly a bit better, mainly because you actually set up this trick of playing knight takes e4. Why does that work? Um, because the white knight can't take back because it's pinned to the king by the black bishop. Good lingo there, Nick. Thank you. Yeah, it's pinned and... Uh, should White do something like F3? Because I've had this move suggested to me by Ooh, quite a few uh, pupils. Now, oh, right. And this is, I think this is a bad move because, let's say, for instance, you were to take the pawn on E4 with your knight. I think, obviously, at first glance, it looks like a good move because uh, it looks like a bad move because you can just take it. But that queen could now come in and check the king. And how do you get out of that? You either have to move your king or you move the pawn up to G3. It certainly looks a bit drafty. Where are you going with this? Keep going. Keep and, now, going. and now I'm going to take the pawn on e4 with my uh, queen, because the knight still can't take it because he's pinned. Uh, you can either, again, move the uh, king or uh, try and block it 
And uh, yeah, it looks like Black's got quite a reasonable position. Are you finished? Right, yes. excellent. That's <laughs> I think we got there in the end. Um, superb analysis. Um, what Nick's saying is the standard trap down here trying to attack the rook and the king. The only problem for you in this position, and there's always a little problem. Oh, Nick's saying could you go like queen two? It's queen yeah. e two. And although that knight is attacked, the problem is that we can't take it with the queen because we're pinned, aren't we? Yes. And we can't take it with the knight because our queen's going to be hanging. My analysis ground, ground to a halt there. Did you notice? Because I kind of looked at queen e <laughs> two and then thought. That, I can't see how hard And if black good. takes, white can actually just play knight D knight. takes E2 and white saves the piece. Ah. Now, Nick is our resident cob player here on Chess on Toast. He analysed all out but missed the key move right at the end. Now, that's not too bad, but as we know, um, you should generally try to analyse as far ahead as possible yeah. before you commit to any such plan such as knight takes E4. Let's just go back to that position there. Nick suggested that sacrifice on E4. A very risky strategy for both players to be actually encountering because... Yeah. Black's trying to heavily punish this F3 move, which we normally don't like to move our F pawn, do we? No. Because as you said, Nick, trying to... He does open the possibility of traps, That's especially right. with that queen coming into uh, H4. So Knight takes E4 was a very good idea to, to remember, and it's one for the viewers to... to but also in a game, if you were playing like a standard game, it'd be worth taking the time in that position to analyse that right through to the end and see whether it's worth playing. Exactly. I mean, I think Black should just simply castle, yeah. and after maybe something like Bishop C4... I really like the idea of trying to strike in the centre and try and smash open this. So it still could be good for black because of the fact that the king's a little bit more open now. Oh, this is yeah. a very bad idea for white to play f3 yeah. because now that diagonal is open towards the king and if white should ever castle there, that's never going to be good. So f3 is the sort of move that, you know, I say weakish or improving player might consider but you never want to move your f pawn like that except in certain, certain circumstances. And here generally, got it's yeah. a bad idea. Yeah. But Mickey, guess what? He knows his stuff. And he realises <laughs> that the best way to defend the pawn is bishop d3. For anyone who's watched our DVDs on, or our first DVD on the Scotch Four Knights will know that. But here it's a blunder because black can win the knight on d4. Wow. So that explains Mickey's next move, knight takes c6. Because when black captured back, notice he captured that way and not the other way. Because you could just swap the queens Because white off, can swap yeah, queens... Um... Well, it's not that bad for black, but... Uh, black can't castle now. Black can't castle. Well, the queens are off, so the king is not in so much danger here. However, it's still a good idea to try and castle as early yeah. as you can. So, Fresnay captured towards the centre, and now bishop d3. So here, there are no problems on the d4 square, and the pawn is defended. So, d5, attacking in the centre, very sensible move. Uh, they swapped, and both sides castled. So this is all given in our DVD. Now, Nicky's next move, h3, we didn't cover. Now, I'm not saying that we've missed out something really important here. Well, no, we're on move 10. I think that's fine. <laughs> yeah, and it's a sensible move because most, you know, I was teaching earlier today, for example, and one of my eight-year-old pupils said, oh, I really like playing that move, Mr. DeCosta, because it stops any funny yeah. business here, and also any back rank checkmates that we might be befall ourselves in the future. So, and it does slightly weaken the dark squares around the king, doesn't it? It slightly. sort of does. I think this this diagonal here might be yeah. something that black might be interested it's sort in. Of, I mean, obviously it's got obvious pluses, but it's also got maybe maybe a few negatives as well to it. Yeah, but I think if we're going to move any pawn, probably the H pawn one definitely, square like yeah, this is, is the safest one. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we like, we like to kind of keep those pawns pretty static so that they're being defensive but if you have to move one it would be the H pawn. Yeah. That's right. Normally we covered bishop g5 trying to set up this attack on here and then on to d5 and we looked at c6, queen f3, bishop e7, rook e1. That's what we covered in our DVD and it's still the, the approach I recommend. Um, there's also another interesting variation which is the move knight a4 here and that looks a bit strange because knights on the rim are dim aren't they? They certainly are. But the point is that that's a potential outpost bearing in mind there's no black B pawn to yeah. kick it away like that. So if White can consider something like Bishop E3 and trying to go into C5, yeah. and also what it does, it allows White to play C4 and attack the centre. So it's a very more sort of like positional way to approach this position. So that's not really one that a lot of juniors like to do. They like to attack, which is why we recommended Bishop G5, which is a sensible developing move. But after H3, we see that play tends to resemble what we looked at in our DVD, Nick, which was both sides develop. And now we see Bishop G5, so the pressure attacking mounting onto the f6 square. So Fresno, of course, could go pawn to c6. I think he's got to be a little bit careful, because, for example, if bishop takes f6, black would have to take with the queen, because if g takes f6, can you see a winning tactic for white already? Um, could you? Ooh. Uh, 
This is not easy, but uh, it's the sort of thing that you need to be looking for if you want to play an opening like the Scottish Four Knights. What I, I want you... to do, I want, I want to take the pawn on h7. Is that wrong? Um, you mean you want to play bishop takes h7? You want to give up our only piece that's attacking? <laughs> oh, Was that a big clue? Oh, sorry. I'm sensing that's uh, not right. Then. Well, first of all, by, I mean, queen h5, for example, trying to go onto the same square is yeah. pretty devastating anyway. But there's actually a tactic on the king and the rook. Did you notice oh, that rook on no. b8? Yeah, I hadn't noticed that. I can see the tactic now. You've pointed it out. You can just uh, slide the queen over to g3. And then, of course, you're checking the king, so you have to do something about that. But in the meantime, you're also attacking the rook on b. That's right. So, if only I was there, Nick, in your games to point out if I could highlight a square in green oh, in your games. You I often a, find uh, that one of your uh, most difficult qualities, that you don't turn up in my games and show me what to do. <laughs> I, think, I think it's quite unfair of you. <laughs> so, uh, that's the possibility. But instead, Fresnay played bishop b7. Now, white could, of course, take on f6, but here we're going to reach some standard position, which is very similar to what we looked at in our DVD. And black gets double pawns, but now there's no queen attacking, is there? Because no. the queen's disappeared. So black's king, is, although it's weak, is not the weakest, because no. white's major pieces are all the way over here. Well, what black says is, I've got two bishops. Now, the advantage of two bishops over the knight and bishop is something that improvers and club players don't tend to well, fully appreciate. No. But here we see that black has an open B line to attack, and the bishops like open positions where knights like closed positions. So though this position is completely fine for white, I think Adams as white decided, well, I really want to play with something a bit more ambitiously here. Yeah, at first so, glance it looks bad for black, but actually black's got good compensation. That's right, yeah. I mean, I remember when I was young, I never wanted to have this weak sort of king position no. around my... Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, just, just for me, to had to have that, I'd be like, no, I definitely don't want to have that big hole in front of my king. No, but if White had a queen on the board, I think it'd be even worse. Sure, yeah, yeah. Like the queen, as we saw. But then I suppose in this position, you could even do something, and I don't know if this is a good idea, but you could move your king to, to h8 and then bring the rook onto. Oh, wait, wait, who's have... attacking who here? Well, that's trying what I'm to saying. Me? But what I'm sa this is why I'm saying that it's not too bad for Black now, but, you know, there are potential, there's a potential to put that rook onto the G file and um, attack at some point in the future. Wow, you Nick want us to counter-attack on White here, so yeah, I'm, definitely possible. I'm a, I'm a club player, I want to attack. <laughs> <laughs> so in the game, White played Knight B5. Now that looks also a little bit strange, but the point is, and anyone who saw our DVD, I believe it was Chapter 3 in our first DVD, Nick, where we talk about this Knight on a C3, and it's not really doing a lot. I mean, it is doing a lot, but that pawn's quite defended, isn't it? Yeah. So we looked at this plan of going Knight E1, to e knight d1 to e3 to f5 and if we manage to land the knight there that knight would be pretty troublesome for black because we'd start to look at the g7 square right so that's someone who's anyone who's looked at our dvds will have noticed that now what adams has decided instead of doing that maneuver he instead played knight b5 and how is he going to get to f5 from there oh you could maybe go to d4 yeah you can go to d4 but also simultaneously he's attacking the pawn on a7 so he's trying to lure back into doing something like a6 which wasn't played because then he gets to go knight to to uh, d4, and after something like this... So black's kind of wasting time and making white do the moves that he wants to do anyway. Well, I wouldn't say black's wasting time, because no, c5 is a nice is move. Like, obviously, black. he's doing moves, good moves, but they're basically forcing white to play the moves he wanted to play anyway. That's right, white's plan. So here, yeah. in any middle game position, you get your pieces out, you think, what's my plan? And Adams has come up with quite a good plan. So instead, first they played bishop e7. Probably here he was a little bit concerned about that knight. Rook e1. Um, we could have taken the pawn, but I think that's very risky because after something like c6, where's the knight going to be able yeah. to retreat? And the knight looks longingly at his uh, comrades trying to ask, well, am I going to get get myself out of this position now? Because black's got moves like queen b6 and rook a8, and I think the knight's going to be pretty bad there. So that was a bit of a poison pawn, wasn't it? Yeah. Black sort of lured white into trying to take it, but actually it's not good. So rook e1, and black decides, well, I'm going to go d4. And here we, um, white played queen f5, noticing the discovered attack onto the queen. So after queen f5, I would say that, well, it, I mean, white, Mickey's our friend, so we're going to obviously groove him, but I still <laughs> prefer white's position here, because white's threatening something pretty dangerous in this position, something that actually game-ending. Well, yeah, what, that, he, uh, that looks like do? a big threat there, because you could whip off the knight on f6. And what's that knight defending? And the knight is defending the pawn on h7, and of course that would you could take it with check, follow it up with checkmate. Good, so after a6, bishop takes f6, yeah, take removing that. the defence of the pawn on h7. And check. Notice that bishop, king f8, only move, and checkmate because the rook is so... 
Black was actually, my well, white played queen f5, but it was a bit of a subtle threat, wasn't it? Because he's threatening to go uh, queen takes h7 in t two moves. So. I, well, I'd say there was nothing subtle about that threat. I'd say that, <laughs> that's a glaringly obvious threat. What, bull in a china shop style? <laughs> now, Black could have, gone, of course, gone g6, but that would be... Risky. Well, maybe after I'd, white what? just goes back to f4. Oh, no, you couldn't do what I was going to do. No, please go ahead. Nick. No, no, it's a terrible. Don't we want to embarrass you on 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 YouTube? <laughs> no. Because Why would I, I want to do that? I would have lost the queen, so let's ignore what I was. Were doing. you trying to sacrifice your queen? Like I was going to sacrifice my rook, actually, but uh, ah, well, the only way you can do that is rook takes e seven. I know, but then you just you lose your queen. queen. Yeah, I re I realised it was a bad move, which is why I didn't want us to go. <laughs> right, let's just dwell on this one for a second. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so. So uh, now Fresno played a very dangerous move here, which is knight e4. And I say dangerous, I mean dangerous for him. Because that move looks as though it, it's only defended by one piece, but it's being attacked by three white pieces. But what he's done is he's cleverly d worked out that there's some tactics involved on this bishop. Okay. And after bishop takes e4, which looks like it just wins a piece, g6. This is incredibly dangerous chess tactics from from Lauren Fresny, but since he's such a strong player, he would have had it all worked out. So I won't dwell on it too much, but basically the position ends up where there's a, a mass exchange like this. And uh, it looks as though White's attacking, well, potential has disappeared. I mean, his queen's gone on the gone to the queen's side. But I would say that these pawns are now targets. So this is what a good chess player can do, Nick. He can, he or she, is able to recognise that, well, do you know what? I wanted to attack, but in this position I don't really have... The, the pieces and the the correct sort of yeah. configuration of pieces to try and attack, bearing in mind that all my pieces are now on the queen side, like this. So what I'm going to do is now target all of those weak pawns in green, and I'm going to go after those, and in fact this is what happens in the game, because after we see a sort of couple of exchanges, white emerges a pawn ahead, and now the, the position has turned into an endgame. And we don't really have time to sort of dwell on this endgame, because it's a very interesting endgame, but I'm going to whip through the next few moves, and we see a whole load of exchanges of pieces here. Wow, the pieces. Just just from a few moves ago, we had a lot of pieces on the board. and uh, It's like yeah. a huge Dyson Hoover has just applied itself to the board. And just <laughs> hoovered everything off. And uh, Black even decides to go here, which is a clever move, because now he wins the B pawn. So this position looks like it's a complete draw, even though White has this extra what? pawn. Well, that, you, would, you would say that's drawn. That's fun, isn't it? Because that's a white, a past pawn, which we usually say is very strong. It but is. But it's not very far down it's the board. It's not very far. Look, that's the, the yeah. battlefield it has to go up to. And Black's got two rooks and a king to try and stop that. So White has to, to be very careful. And in fact, I'm just going to again through, go through the moves where White attempts to push the pawn. The pawn so gets these blocked. These are the moves of the game, yeah? That's right. This all happened in the game. But... This is all sort of position that White should be quite happy because there's no way that White can lose this unless right, he's yeah. a complete idiot, basically. And, and Mickey definitely isn't. And Mickey isn't. He's a he's a lovely gentleman and a very strong chess player. I think even you couldn't lose this position. <laughs> we could try it later. No, but, I've uh, I've lost better positions. We <laughs> haven't got a queen you can lose. So no, that's true. That's no, true. I do. Th I th I do think I, I could. I could. I could certainly uh, draw this position without a doubt. I think. You mean for White? Yes. <laughs> that, that's good to know. <laughs> so this position where the pieces come, there's a double rook ending, White has a pawn advantage. How is he, what we say, going to convert this endgame? And uh, what Mickey decides to do is just sensibly develops his pieces, brings his king into the game. King, by the way, is it good to bring the king into the uh, game when Black has no, or your opponent has very little pieces? On well, him? I think that's the perfect time to bring Black uh, to bring the king into the game because uh, early on we say don't bring your king into the centre because there's obviously big pieces like the queen flying around. Uh, but later on, the king can be quite a powerful piece and joining the, uh, as long as it's an end game and there's not too many opposing pieces on the board. And would a club player describe this as an end game? Oh, definitely, yeah. I think an end game, I mean, in most cases, it's when the queens have come off, but now you're just down to a rook, a rook and pawn end game, so definitely. Yep. As a club player, I would say that is definitely an end game. Good. So again, a couple of manoeuvring moves. Um, the black defends quite stoically here. And now white manages to exchange off a pair of rooks, and normally this would they would say... Um, when you're pawn down, you should try and exchange pieces. That's the general rule in an endgame. If black were to swap off most of the, the pawns, in fact, if, if you're black... pawn down, you want to exchange off pieces, or if you're pawn up, if you want to. Um, well, if black could exchange off all of those pawns on right. the king side, that yeah. would be a very well. It'd be a basically a draw. 
Okay. Um, so Black actually wants to swap off the pawns here. I see. What Black does not want to do though is swap off the rooks because right. if we swapped off the rooks here, then that rook, it would be a king yeah. and pawn ending where White would be a pawn ahead, and that would be bad. So knowing you know end games are very tricky for, for improvers and players. They're tricky for everybody actually, and uh, it takes someone of the gall of Mickey Adams to try and force the win in this position, and he manages to do so. He slowly forces Black to make a concession, which means F6, and that weakens all of these pawns now, doesn't it? So all it takes is for white to bring his rook in, like this, and that's a very clever move, rook a6, because if black swaps, although we said black would like to swap off pawns, the problem is if he loses that one, he's probably going to lose that yeah. one, and then white's got three amazing pawns here. So for example, rook g7, how do you think white would win that pawn, Nick? Uh, I'd now move the king up to g5, doubling attack. Yeah, and I thought this pawn. should be winning because we're going to win the pawn, aren't we? Yeah. So rook a6, a very clever move. So Black decides to defend it. And again, we have a bit of a manoeuvring phase here. Very clever from White. He just bides his time. And in fact, he even gives up the D-pawn. So it looks like it's a complete draw. But It's interesting because he's, sort of, he's got the fact that the Black King has to kind of cover that D-pawn. So his king and, and the rook can kind of manoeuvre. That's right. They can like, harass the other pawns the in the meantime. Because the Black King really can't, can't help the defence of the other pawns. That's right. And this was a very clever move. Most players would just have gone rook G7 here. Yeah. But Adam's... I mean, being the technically gifted player he is, he realises that if we go here first, because of that opposition rule here, the black king now has to go to the queen's side, doesn't it? Has to move further away from has the Has to pawns. move further away. Yeah. And after king c4, rook g7, right. the king is one square further so away like from the back king. bought himself one more move. That's basically. right. And in yeah. an endgame, that could be crucial. Absolutely. In well, fact, we've that's seen what before in our videos where like, an endgame is literally won by just being having one move, having a tempo. And I think that's exactly what happens, Nick, because after Fresnay's g5, which is the only try, all the pawns come off. And now we've got this endgame where the, it's just the pawn and a rook. And we did say that Black would like to get this position, but his king is too far away. So he desperately tries to run back. And he, in fact, very nearly manages to. Um, this is the sort of position that most people would still struggle to win. But what we're going to reach is a position called the Lucina position. And it's something that club players or any good player really needs to know. Because what happens now is that Black is unable to stop Black, uh, White getting this. Do you know the winning technique here, Nick? This is called the Lucina position. And uh, it's one that almost every one of my pupils never... Well, they know it, but they never know how to actually do it. The problem is we need to get our king out of the way in order to push the pawn, don't we? Yeah. But wherever we move the king, I mean, we can't even move the king here. This was the point of rook h1 to prevent the white king running away to the king's side. And the black king stops the king running to the queen's side. So after rook f7 check, in fact, he resigned here. But let's just go through the next few moves very briefly. The point is that if black does this, or any other passing move, we go check. And there's a reason why he went to e4. This is called building the bridge. Now we are able to bring the king out because we're threatening there, aren't we? Yeah. Black has to just keep checking. And what we're going to do is we're going to use that white rook on e4 to hide the king. Watch what happens here. Still ah. threatening this. And after rook g1 check, what's the building the bridge we can do? What can you we can now move the, the white rook in between them. That's right. And after the, the swap... Black's king, is it close enough to control it's that not, square? No, it's not. No, close. if it was on e7, would it be? Uh, what yes, because black could then move into f7. And it would be a draw. So, it is so one that's square. the point yeah. of what happened in the game. Just go back in, uh, go back a few moves. Why he went rook f4 is very important. He went there because oh. after this, he forces the king away. If king so f6... I was going to say, why, why can't the king come to f6? So then king f8 and... Ah, right. Yeah. Okay, okay, and yeah. black can try a bit, bit of a cheeky move. It's not checkmate. Why is it not checkmate? Because oh, because the rook, the can, right rooks, yeah, white yeah, still yeah, has a yeah. rook, and it's going to be queen versus king. Oh. So a very te technical game by Mickey Adams. That's amazing. But I think the point of this game, well, us showing this game, was the idea of the Scotch Four Knights played by one of the world's top players. You know, not saying that he used our DVD. That's uh, <laughs> the rumours of that have yet to be founded. But even Mickey said, I mean, Mickey said to to, to both of us that you know those. The DVDs basically showed him. It was like when he was learning as well. That, you know, he those ideas that we showed in the DVD reminded of him of when he was learning how to play chess. That's right, like a trip down memory lane. Yeah, so, and he's uh, become one of the greatest players in the world. That's right. So um, there you have it, Mickey winning the game for his uh, foreign SEAL team, and 
I don't think it was enough for them to win the title, but that's for another day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, Lauren. That was a very exciting game by a good friend of Chess on Toast, Mickey Adams. As I said at the beginning, you can check out uh, our website for the new DVD releases. We've got them all available. Check out www.chessontoast.com. Uh, for International Master Lauren Da Costa, this is me, Nick Murphy, signing off. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>